Uh, I want to get your thoughts on Sir Roger Penrose, Nobel Prize winner, good friend of the show. His take is that human consciousness is non-algorithmic and so it is not even capable of being modeled by Turing machines. And he actually believes in sort of a quantum mechanical understanding of human consciousness. He implies that not only quantum mechanics is responsible for consciousness, but gravitational forces are at work via what's called the vial curvature, which is a, a derivative of Einstein's stress energy tensor and gravitational uh, curvature tensor, G mu nu. So what do you make of these physical interpretations where the, where the microtubules are caused to their wave functions col collapse? Uh, caused by the local variance of a classical field. So quantum mechanics propitiates a, uh, is propitiated by a uh, classical mechanical uh, structure like Einstein's relativity. The G mu nu is a classical tensor. It is not quantum at all. What do you make of these physical interpretations? I think it's malarkey. <laughs> Now, and I thought so, you know, I think I wrote perhaps the first review of Roger Penrose's uh, Emperor's New Mind, and I pointed out the problem right there. He has the wrong notion of algorithm that he's using there. He's thinking of algorithms for things. And look, there's, an, there's no feasible algorithm for chess. There isn't. It's, it's not an infinite game. But it's, there's no feasible algorithm for it, almost certainly. Well, that means computers can't play chess, right? No, it doesn't mean that at all. It means that they can play very good chess. It's just that the algorithms that they use are algorithms for playing legal chess. And, some, and how many of those are there? There's gazillions. And some of them are better than others. There's no algorithm for being a perfect mathematician, but there's algorithms for learning a hell of a lot and doing pretty well. And don't expect that you're going to have an algorithm that guarantees truth ever. He's just setting up a preposterous standard for what a mind is. And right, so does that mean the mind is not algorithmic? No, it means there isn't the master algorithm. Even some people in AI sometimes talk about the master algorithm, but it's not a master algorithm in the sense that the, the, uh, Penrose thinks. It's an algorithm for doing pretty darn well. <laughs> and how many of those are there? Kazillions. That's right. More than stars in the sky. The big, the big mistake, this big mistake goes back to Descartes who wondered if he could trust his clear and distinct ideas. And he decided he could if, if God would guarantee them. And so he tried to prove the existence of God so he could trust his clear and distinct ideas. That's a hopeless quest. The best we can do is gather the smartest people around we could find, let them compete to find the truth, and see where you find conciliance, see where you find agreement. And that's the best you can do when it's good enough. It, get, it gets us to the moon. It gets uh, robots to Mars. Um, it builds bridges and, and cures diseases and allows us to predict eclipses years in advance. All of that knowledge is defeasible. It's not like geometry. And even in the context, you know, staying with Einstein for a bit, my, my favorite, you know, kind of counterpoint to the claims of AI, you know, apocalypse is the so-called story of Einstein's happiest thought, which you may know, but I'll repeat it. So Einstein said, quote, my happiest thought was that an observer in free fall would experience no gravitational forces. And it led to the conception of the so-called Einstein equivalence principle. And the reason I bring that up is because I'm curious how a computer might be expected to, A, visualize what free fall might feel, that sensation in the pit of one's stomach as you, you know, crest a hill or on a roller coaster or launch on a SpaceX rocket, A, and B, whether or not said computer could identify with this happiest thought. In other words, 
there seems to be something, you know, sui generis, something, I don't know, uh, that Einstein could have felt. And I don't know, I, I propose that as the Keating test, you know, <laughs> can, can algorithms come up with completely new laws of physics, laws of nature, things that are verifiable, empirical, connected to data such as the type that my colleagues and I collect through our telescopes. What's your take on that? Are there possible worlds where, you know, possible scenarios where AI can actually create new laws of physics, not discover, oh, well, the Navier-Stokes equation behaves like this, so we should render smoke like that. No, no, no. Truly new, a Newton's uh, sixth law, uh, you know, something, a fifth the law of thermodynamics. Can you envision that, Dan? Yeah. I'll, I'll tell you why. Yeah. All learning, all invention, all discovery is a matter of generate and test. It's all, that's what evolution does. It's what we do. Right now, you've got lots of possible thoughts running through your head. Some of them are get, getting thought and some of them are dying. They're not, they're not rising to the level of you're not going to say them and you're not even really going to think them. But it's, that's what's going on in your head. It's what's going on in my head right now. We're all cherry pickers. Now, cherry pickers... First you do it rough, then you do the quality control. You have the, the fountain that generates lots of stuff, and then you have the critic, the uh, judger, who decides what's worth further work. I think that LLMs, for instance, can be very valuable in the fountain role in the generation role. They can be very good at generating off the wall things that you or I would never think of. Why? Because they're not like you and I. They're, they're, they're different. They're enough different that they can come up with gonzo ideas that might, for someone, someone might say, oh, I wish I'd thought of that. But I never would have thought of that. Now, we all have styles. Chopin had his style. Mahler had his style. Beethoven had his style. Wonderful. But that means Chopin doesn't have Rimsky-Korsakov's style or Rachmaninoff's style. Don't expect Chopin to write a Gershwin tune. He could hear it just fine, but it would never occur to him. And I think that LLMs feeding on the scrapings of the internet for years and years and tremendous data mining and digesting, but not just the way we do it. They might be a great source of thinking outside the box, out off the wall ideas that we who are humans would just not, it wouldn't occur to us and they'd be right. Look, when we look at the history of great science, we see that the really wonderful breakthroughs are often where people come up with an idea that first seems sort of daft and even outrageous, even impossible and say, so wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, maybe something here. And I think that uh, we've now got a new generator to go with our testers. And we're still going to rely on human testers. Well, they can do some testing too. The, the AIs can do some testing. But I think we want to keep them as smart machines, not artificial colleagues. We don't want to give them the autonomy they could have because then they'll be dangerous. How do we enforce that? By keeping them parasitical, making them machines that don't have to fend for themselves, that we can unplug. 